thanks for everyone that's joined already. Um, we're incredibly excited to welcome you all here today uh, to the first of these events uh, on Tevent, uh, the new platform, which are going to be basically just showcasing um, different approaches and economic schools of thought outside of the mainstream. Uh, we're really lucky to be joined today by Professor Derek Hamilton, uh, who's going to be introducing stratification economics to us. Um, and we're also later on going to hear from Professors uh, Stephanie Scarino and Dania Francis, as well as Carl Moore. So we've got a great lineup and we're really excited. Uh, in terms of just some housekeeping things, if you want to ask any questions, then there's a Q&A tab and you can submit your questions there or vote on other people's questions. Um, and we're not going to take too many in this session, but if we'll, we'll, we'll definitely take a couple. So if you see any questions you like, make sure to give them a merit um, in that part of the uh, function. And then also we've got the chat function. And if you just want to kind of start any discussions in there um, or keep on posting where, where you're calling in from, then that'd be amazing. Um, you should also be able to see on your screen um, at the bottom of the stage, kind of a, a way, a, a load of emojis, which you can use to react. Um, and they'll be like kind of popping up uh, for Derek as he speaks. Yep. So someone's clapping, you can see at the top of your screen. Um, so yeah, so be sure to use those as well. It's just a nice little touch. Um, and yeah, that, that's about it for me. I'll, I'll come back at the end um, to take the couple of questions and also just to um, kind of describe how to get to the stages that are happening after this one. Uh, but apart from that, that's me done. So um, yeah, Derek, take it away. Well, let me begin with gratitude um, and the fact that this is an honor and a privilege to be on this stage. And um, I'm happy we're at this moment. I mean, 10 years ago, it might have been hard to predict that we could be at this moment where we have a cadre of people that are pushing back on the norms of something that was considered scientific and indisputable. Um, but I think our lived reality has allowed us to push back, that all the, the, the promise um, that has come about from some of the, the jargon around trickle down, uh, and I'll talk about that today, has not come to fruition. And if we just look at the reality of the stark differences based primarily on one's cursory identity, like race, gender, or some other, some other attribute by which people, frankly, are born with, uh, how problematic that is. Um, you, you'll hear me talk a lot today about norms. And um, I think many of us should own our norms a little more. We should recognize, and I'll talk about this, that there really isn't a strictly positivist endeavor that everything starts with some value, some view about the state of the world and some belief about what's right and wrong. And, you know, I think we should own it. This is economics about justice, seeking justice. So here's the context across the globe. And, and also I should give a shout out to my colleagues that will grace this stage after me. They are all wonderful, all three of them. So I encourage everybody to stay on and, and hear, hear the the magnificent talks they will give. Across the globe and throughout history, extreme inequality has persisted and in plain sight, racism, sexism, and other isms are strategically used to consolidate economic and political power for some at the expense of others. This is unjust, this is immoral, and it's all about power relationships. And we're gonna talk about intellectual endeavors to understand those power relationships. Understanding the persistence of extreme inequality and the pivotal roles that race and other group identities such as gender, disability status, and sexual orientation. Understanding the roles that they play in forging political alignments and economic division should be core to our mission as economists. Stratification economics is a theoretical and an empirical approach that challenges and expands the conventional orthodox economic views of human capital attainment and inequality. It goes beyond individual optimizations, infuses insights from many disciplines to examine identity formation, collective group action, and how they relate to social hierarchy and economic outcomes and economic distributions. In a just world, Race, gender, ethnicity, and nativity would have no transactional value in relation to material, psychological, or security outcomes. 
it is overwhelmingly evident that certain identity groups face greater vulnerabilities, and this greater vulnerability is the result of unjust historical and contemporary stratification. As I mentioned, racism, sexism, and other isms are not simply irrational prejudices, but are long leveraged strategic mechanisms for exploitation and, extra and extrapolation that have benefits for some at the expense of others. If we look in this context of a pandemic, we would know that the heaviest toll well beyond class falls on vulnerable racial and gender identity groups, both across and within nation states. And we know that this pandemic will, ser will serve to further expand these existing inequalities and vulnerabilities, that is unless government acts to change this. Racially disparate treatment by law enforcement, as well as health and economic exposure differences to this pandemic, linked to a larger political and economic vulnerability for Black Americans in the American context, as well as Latinx, Indigenous, and other people of color, whether we're in a pandemic or not. The immoral devaluation of Black lives has long been ingrained in the American political economy, and it's long overdue for reckoning. The structures of our political economy and race go well beyond class, go well beyond individual bigotry, and as a matter of course, across the American and global institutional landscapes, race and social identity in general, here's the key point I'm emphasizing, is strategically used to generate hierarchy and propel systems of stratification and this persistent inequality. What we need is a deeper understanding of how devaluing individuals based on their social identities relate to political notions of who's deserving and who's undeserving. This is essential to expand our knowledge beyond conceptions of individual transaction into workings of our larger political economy and structures that affect us all. Many black and brown families have low wealth, inadequate health care, and work in precarious but essential jobs that have few workplace protections, lower wages, and lower benefits. This is the biggest pre-existing condition. In other words, wealth, capital, and power themselves are pre-existing conditions. We do not have an adequate social safety net in place. What we have is over five decades of deregulation and a market revolution that has been supported by a neoliberal vis vision of supply side economics under the lure that structures and government subsidies that benefit corporate interests, the so-called job creators, would generate a market dynamism of economic activity that's supposed to lift every proverbial boat. The promise trickled down from this vision has never come to fruition. Right now, incrementalism and changes on the margin, they're not going to cut it. To reverse these decades and, of, and generations of poverty, discrimination, and economic and political concentration at the top, we're going to need a bold overhaul of our laws and our economy. We're faced with a choice. We can continue down this path of deregulation, lower taxes on the wealthy, and gutting of government programs and social welfare or we can make a profound change towards a more sustainable and moral economy with government interventions to facilitate assets, economic security, engagement, human dignity, and social mobility for all our people, regardless of their race, their class, their gender, their sexual identity, or their immigrant status. We need a new industrial policy that centers workers, both domestically and abroad, coupled with an explicitly anti-racist and anti-sexist economic rights platform that would promote a fairer economy that's grounded in our shared prosperity. The civil and political aspects of human rights, they have been well ingrained in our political psyche. However, at least as important are economic rights, the right to assembly, the right to speech, the right to choice in general, they're illusionary for individuals who lack basic needs like a job, adequate income, shelter, food, or health care. Although it was never realized in the American context for Black people, um, there's nothing new or radical about the concept of economic rights, or I should say it was never extended. Um, 
President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in his 1944 State of the Union address. I like to remind people he called for an economic bill of rights. He talked about physical security, economic security, social security, and he used the word moral security. Roosevelt knew that necessitous men and women were not free men and women. For Roosevelt, full citizenship demanded more than political rights, it required economic rights. His first article of that second Bill of Rights was the right to employment. That federal job guarantee concept also has deep roots in our civil rights history. Led by Reverend Martin Luther King, the Poor People's Campaign. Uh-oh, I think uh, my computer just went to a blank screen. Let me make sure I'm still on. All right. Uh, led by the Poor People's Campaign, um, we also they also had a focus on economic rights uh, with uh, people like Martin Luther King Jr. as well as Coretta, Coretta Scott King um, endorsing tenets for these rights, which were a meaningful job at a living wage, a secure and adequate income for all, access to land, access to capital, and the ability to have a truly significant role in our government. In other words, civic engagement. However, our contemporary political economy radically situates the market as a great, efficient, self-regulating, colorblind arbiter of our worth and the solution for all our problems, economic or otherwise. Our economic profession and its so-called positivist approach are culpable in advancing this paradigm. This is why it's important that economists are um, engaged in political economy as well. The term political economist, unfortunately, has become an albatross, as if the field is somehow weaker scientifically and less objective. But one need not sacrifice rigor to study how institutions and behaviors intertwine with an objective of building economic inclusion. Likewise, we need to recognize that all scholarship is rooted in some norms, especially scholarship that claims to study production, transaction, and distribution. Orthodox economics is based on a different dogma, a faith in markets that somehow they're natural, transparent, efficient, and inevitable. The problem with that belief is that it does not give enough credence to the political actions that form and codify markets in the first place. Instead, the presumption that markets are simply natural, it leads to a false notion of fairness, that somehow if each individual is free to pursue their own profit and happiness, then that this will ultimately lead to the greater good for society. Um, markets, whether they're product markets, labor markets, financial markets, they're presumed to be self-regulating. The most astute, the most valued, the, mo the hardest workers, they're believed to prosper and endure, while the least astute, the least valued, the laziest, they're presumed to receive their just rewards or simply fade away and have to find something else to do over time. Under this ideology, government interventions that promote social mobility, they're deemed inefficient and counterproductive. Public provisioning to help the working class, they're purported to distort or worse, incentivize unproductive behaviors that are gonna deter from these so-called productive market behaviors. In this system, in this system of labor exploitation and political and economic consolidation, Freedom and choice are weaponized. They're weaponized as rhetorical devices intended to appeal to one's desire for agency and desire not to be a victim. Race, along with government and social programs, they're used as scapegoats to fuel a neoliberal agenda. Poverty and inequality, they are attributed to deficiencies internal to the poor and blacks themselves. And stigmatization based on race and an anti-blackness frame they are strategically used as political fodder in order to implement harsh and punitive control on the underclass. Blacks have become the symbolism of what we define as undeserving welfare queens, deadbeat dads, and super predators, and they're treated as a surplus population. This feeds into a proverbial American narrative that through hard work and effort, individuals could turn their proverbial rags into riches. We use individual anecdotes as evidence 
of the power of efforts and of free market efficacy. But what's not offered in this neoliberal paradigm is the systematic evidence of countless cases of hardworking individuals who are not able to attain social mobility. And likewise, the anecdotes of the individuals born into privilege who maintain privilege, not because of efforts, but simply because of a birthright. These presumptions that the market define pay little attention to the roles of power and initial capital or initial endowment and how power and capital can adjust to alter rules and structures of markets or rules and structures of transactions in order to privilege that power and capital in the first place. Without capital and power, inequality is locked in. Words like choice, freedom to describe the benefits of the market, again, they're illusionary for individuals that don't have an adequate job, income, shelter, food, or health care. It is literally wealth that gives us choice, freedom, and optionality. Economic freedom and authentic agency is rooted in resources, political resources, social resources, psychological resources, and especially material resources. And power and capital are self-reinforcing. And without government interventions, they will do what they do best. They will consolidate and they will iterate. Our unjust racial wealth gap is itself an implicit measure of our race's past. It's rooted in a history in which whites have been privileged by government complicit political and economic interventions to afford them access to resources and the iterative intergenerational accumulation that comes about from those resources. This is in contrast to a history in which blacks and indigenous people, their personhood and whatever capital and resources they may have been able to establish have always been vulnerable to exploitation and extrapolation. And this exploitation and extrapolation was state complicit. There was confiscation, destruction, terror, fraud, theft, and other acts of violence. This history of disenfranchisement of black Americans from full economic protection and participation is well documented. Documented by, with policies like redlining, highway constructions, failure to desegregate schools in the metropolitan level, exclusionary zoning, they have all worked in tandem with restrictive covenants and regulatory controls to marginalize Black Americans and constrain their economic participation as well as their political power. Yet the framing of our racial wealth gap in a contemporary, in a contemporary context, including the use of alternative financial service products, it focuses on poor financial choices and decision market and decision making on the part of largely black, Latino, and other poor borrowers. The framing is tied to and derived from a culture of poverty thesis in which blacks are presumed to undervalue and have a low acquisition for education. That framing is wrong. The directional emphasis is wrong. It is more likely that meager economic circumstance in the first place, not poor decision-making or deficient knowledge that constrains choice itself and leaves poor borrowers with little to no other financial options, but to attain and use predatory and abusive financial services. Financial behavior and financial literacy, they are practically useless, useless for households with no finances to manage in the first place. Still, high achieving black Americans as measured by education, they exhibit large economic and health disparities relative to their white peers with high levels of education. And when it comes to health and wealth, these disparities not only are, are persistent, they often grow with higher levels of education. The fact that blacks who live in, in families where the head graduated from college typically have less wealth than white families where the head dropped out of high school, that's an example of a property right in whiteness. The fact that a black expectant mother is more likely to have an infant death than a white expectant mother who dropped out of high school, as well as the fact that a black man with a college degree is more likely to die from a stroke than a white man who dropped out of high school. These are all property rights and whiteness. Yet, for the most part, 
social science and policy has focused both implicitly and explicitly on the lower socioeconomic status of blacks and that perceived confluence with detrimental behaviors and attitudes as the explanation for racial, economic, and health disparities. Few studies explore the paradox, the paradox of increasing racial health and economic disparity at higher levels of socioeconomic strata. The emergent consensus around the social determinant of health, where the World Health Organization defines as the conditions in which individuals are born, grow, live, and work as the primary determinants of health, and likewise, one would presume the primary determinants of health disparity, um, they need to be a, a little bit reevaluated. The presumption is that if a greater share of Black and Latinx, and, and let, me, let me be clear, social determinants matter. Um, my computer went into sleep mode again. Sorry with my technological problems. Um, social determinants matter, but as I, as I mentioned, there's an independent factor associated with race and social identity as well. The presumption is that if a greater share of Black and Latinx individuals invested more in a good education, that in turn would result in better jobs, higher income, and health disparity and economic disparity would dramatically reduce or be eliminated. But again, education is positively associated with better health and economic outcomes for everyone, but disparities in health, labor, and financial markets persist or even worsen at higher levels of education. In general, black men and women between the ages of 25 and 64 are 50% more likely to have to die than their white counterparts. But what's even more disheartening, these mortality disparities increase with education. Black men and women with a college degree have nearly a 70% higher mortality rate than similarly educated whites. That's not consistent with a social determinant model that proxies individual self-investments in agency with education as the explanation for health disparity. In many cases, the most educated blacks, just like in the infant mortality example, have worse outcomes than the least educated whites. It may be the case that low SES Blacks face higher levels of stress than their higher SES Black peers, but as social economic status rises, so may the stress and the required coping efforts faced by these high-achieving Blacks relative to their white high-achieving peers. Education matters within group, but since social structures do not permit Black people to convert education into desired outcomes at the same rates as whites, they're not protected by social class as measured by education in the same way as white. Racial differences in key outcomes cannot be fully explained by a clustering amongst the less skilled. Unsurprising within group, more educated is associated with better outcomes. However, the irony is that across group, black workers with a college degree are harmed more relative to similarly qualified whites and this difference gets amplified during economic downturns. We overstate the functional role of education to the detriment of understanding the functional roles of wealth and power. There are physical and psychological costs of stigma and ironically exerting individual agency. In other words, working twice as hard to get by, and that explains the limited role of education and income as protective health factors and economic factors for blacks relative to whites. The bootstrap narrative framed in the politics of personal responsibility that emphasizes individual agency, particularly self-investments in education as the pathway for upward mobility and efficient social distribution, it might literally have a bad effect on health for black people. That rhetoric, that's what I'm talking about. Stratification economic recognizes that there are positive and negative returns to collective group identity and that they're not just material, but cognitive as well. Psychological benefits and, and distress accrue to individuals based on both their relative and their absolute group positioning. Likewise, the extent that individuals have agency in determining or codifying that group-based identity, identity 
they may be incentivized to invest in that identity, similar to how a, a firm might be incentivized to invest in a particular input, a derived demand that might have a greater social return in the marketplace. Hence, as the social value or the market price on one's group-based identity, such as whiteness, as that rises, so will individuals' incentives to invest in that identity. Thus, the orthodox conception of race as a simple exogenous variable, it is theoretically naive. The conception often leads to interpretation that the view of the individual trait like race, we interpret that as having some causal related relationship with an outcome. And we don't even offer an explanation. Stratification economics views these models as deterministic and lacking rigor to examine alternative relevant hypotheses. Ultimately, our myopic overemphasis on individual optimization over an emphasis on group formation and collective action, that's what leads orthodox economics to accentuate differences in individual attributes like human capital endowment, like motivation, like attitudes as explanations for these intergroup differences. With stratification economics, we look beyond these individual factors and we investigate structural and contextual factors that preserve the relative status of a dominant group via intergenerational resource transfers, as well as exclusionary practices to explain persistent intergroup disparities. Let me take a bit of an aside to discuss intersectionality, the inseparable intersections of race, gender, family, and economic circumstances. Media accounts from the groundbreaking study by Rod Chetty and his peers, which links IRS tax records and census data across race, across gender, across, and across generations. It has focused on a finding that in a New York Times article said, quote, black boys raised in America, even in the wealthiest families and living in some of the most well-to-do neighborhoods still earn less in, adults, in adulthood than white boys with similar background. But the story emphasized that the findings do not hold for girls and women. When compared to white girls, black girls from similarly affluent families and neighborhoods attained similar incomes as white girls when they both reached adulthood. And this led the authors to conclude, quote, there are a unique set of challenges for black men but here's the problem. Black men and women are not so neatly separable from each other. Their nuanced intergenerational and household structure effects by which economists need to account for when making such analyses. We do not live in a vacuum that neatly allows us to separate women and men from their larger family context. Another example of, of what I'm talking about is Rebecca Pettit's book about invisible men where she emphasizes many of the labor market studies exclude incarcerated individuals who are grossly and disproportionately black men. A negative spillover effect and an intersectional effect of this mass incarceration of black men is the fact that rather than being, rather than being a source of resource for a household, black men in prison further drain household budgets. Compounding this situation is also a growing share of incarcerated black women themselves, especially relative to white women. The outcome is that black women tend to face greater familial and financial and caregiving responsibilities than their white counterparts. The intertwined nature of a woman and a man's life means that the so-called unique challenges faced by black men they would, not know, they would no longer seem so unique if we think about family context. The precarious economic position of black men combined with the rigid interracial marriage market in which black women are the least likely demographic to intermarry, and we could talk about a variety of reasons why that's so, um, result in a pool of eligible, in quotes, spouses that dramatically had lead to a smaller and fewer resources than their white counterparts. Frankly, if we add, you know, th this, this type of analysis is not limited to heteronormative frames. 
The point is that lower resource, especially if we look at the criteria wealth, um, the challenges that black men and women confront together suggest that black women tend to have these greater family and familial and caregiving responsibilities. In our patriarchy, it's unreasonable to separate black and white women from their larger familial and social context. And again, if we add the intergenerational effects of wealth, we know that black women relative to their white women counterparts at every level of income, at every age, married or single, have far less wealth in, in general. And I've already talked about the power of wealth. Economists should do a better job of understanding the roles of power, capital, and intergenerational transfers in our political economy and be more focused on understanding and advocating for structures that truly lead to more equitable and fairer distributions. We are not atomistic agents floating in unfettered markets guided by a free will into fair and efficient allocation. We need to understand how markets themselves may be exploited to actually reinforce inequality. We need a better understanding of how race prejudice itself constitutes a strategic defensive reaction of protective mechanisms that serves the purpose of preserving social hierarchy and enhancing relative position of a dominant group. The trade-off, hold on one second, my screen cut off again. Ooh, I need to invest in knowing how to use my technology better. To, but to fully understand how the status quo of the iterative cycle of a concentrated economic and political power is able to persist so long throughout our society, one would have to embrace a third pillar, not an issue, a third pillar in this relationship. And that is race, or more broadly, the existence of a permanent underclass, an underclass marked by a subaltern identity by which more dominant identity groups are able to maintain the status quo by being willing to sacrifice vertical positioning, in other words, growing overall personal inequality in our society in exchange for horizontal positioning or relative status or social status. Having greater social economic and a political dominant group having re relative status higher in those dimensions than some other group that's marked by a subaltern identity. In essence, a deeper understanding of how devaluing and othering of individuals based on their social identities, how that's essential if we want to expand our knowledge beyond the conceptions of individual transactions into a working of larger political economies and structures that affect us all. The structures of our political economy and race go beyond individual bigotry. We must move beyond class reductionism and recognize that race and other social identity strata are pillars alongside political and economic power. The, there are intermediate economic and psychological benefits associated with distancing oneself from some outgroup, some other group, like being black, towards some in-group identity. In the case of the U.S., that would be the adoption of a white American identity. That frame fits with the classical sociologist Herbert Blummer's thesis that race prejudice exists basically in a sense of group position rather than a set of feelings of which members of one racial group towards another member of another racial group may have. Basically, group relative position transcends individual feelings. This is the impetus for psychological and the material benefits of what we call white privilege or the property rights and whiteness. But there are silver linings and ways in which we can forge change. This privilege is based on an immoral notion of what benefit means. It's largely predicated on a benefit defined in self-interested neoliberal tribal norms in which our accumulation knows no bounds. Uh-oh, did I lose everybody? I can't tell if I'm still going. Oh, I think I'm still going. An authentic racial coalition to address our growing inequality would necessitate that the dominant white group give up the benefits of white privilege 
it's not an easy ask to make. To achieve racial justice, we need an honest and sobering confession of all the historical sins. We also need, beyond that authentic analysis, we need to recognize that it would be empty if not accompanied with some form of material redress in general. That authentic analysis would counter our neoliberal frames that caricature black and brown as well as poor people as undeserving welfare queens, deadbeat dads, and undeserving. And it would pave the way for new narratives that more accurately frame inequality and poverty as being grounded in resources. What's more, we need a bold, transformative, anti-racist and anti-sexist policy regime, which by design and implementation are intentionally inclusive of all racial, ethnic and gender groups. We need to recognize that there are a set of enabling goods and services that are so critical for individual life, liberty and self-determination that their quantity, their quality and access to them should not be vulnerable to the pricing and rationing that come about from firms trying to meet fiduciary responsibilities to their shareholders. We need policies with true public options to crowd out inferior private options that don't ensure universal and quality access to things like healthcare, housing, schooling, financial services, capital, and the free mobility throughout society without the threat of detention and bodily harm at the hands of a state-sanctioned terror because someone's identity is linked to a vulnerable or stigmatized group. The good news is that change may be happening. We've witnessed across all 50 states and pretty much the entire globe, civil protesters shouting in solidarity that Black Lives Matter. I mean, you can look to yourselves. We have this convening that is taking on the task of rethinking economics. Are younger generations and social movements beginning to redefine economic goods to embrace the principles of morality, common humanity, and sustainability? These values are necessary ingredients if we're ever gonna have an authentic coalition across race, across gender, across sexual orientation to address the common paradigms of our growing inequality. I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that without a potent policy alternative than that neoliberalism that we've had for the last 50 years, that potent policy alternative grounded in justice we need that if we want to neuter racist regimes and provide a pathway for economic security and self-determination for all our people. I encourage us to commit to justice as a matter of faith, just as to a large extent the economic discipline has committed to markets and the two welfare theorems of economics as a dogma that puts that primacy on markets as fair and efficient distribution. We should commit to justice. Timeliness, and I, I don't want to be so hyperbolic to say that other economists aren't grounded in justice, but what I'm saying is commit to it as a matter of faith. faith. Timeliness shouldn't constrain us. We should not be undeterred by what people think is possible or not possible by here and now. We should commit to our shared prosperity. We should recognize that ultimately it is our economy, it is our government, and it is our monetary system that will enable us to afford the policies that invest in our most treasured resources, which is our people. Thank you. All right, here's the question. From your perspective, which similarities and differences are there between institutional economics and stratification economics? Uh, Look, so I'll go with, maybe I'll try two and then I'll, I'll try to answer them. Do you think that wealth and health inequality will improve in the U.S. with the election of Biden? Further, what are the hurdles that politicians at all levels will face in closing the gap over the next decade? All right, so these are different enough questions where I'll, I'll take them in turn. All right, so institutional economics and stratification economics. So, you know, to some extent, this is related to a question of, how different is stratification economics from other forms of non or of, of heterodox, including uh, 
institutional economics, and there are others that we probably could talk about as well. Um, there are some differences and some similarities. Um, clearly, institutions relate to structures and have political dimensions. And in, in that regard, I think there's room for, strat for stratification and institutional economics to, describe, to be described somewhat as uh, synergistic or synonyms. But I think a clear distinction of stratification economics that is new and original and has not been fully captured by any other form of economics to date, to my knowledge, is treating race and other social identities not as peripheries, not as something that's predetermined, but straight as an investment good itself, as something that is integral to the process, that is a pillar in the relationships of our political and economic institutions. I think that that understanding is the next evolution that could perhaps revolutionize systems and revolutionize our movements where we understand that a, a tactical strategy, especially as we become more unequal in a, horizontal, in a vertical sense, is to exploit the human desires for not only absolute positioning, but relative positioning. And to exploit that desire for relative positioning and our willingness to trade off our, our vertical positioning, to exploit that as a mechanism to create division so as to stop worker solidarity, so as to stop collective action, so as to offer somebody an intermediary position with tangible material and psychological benefits. You know, we have these notions that um, if we just have um, class solidation, that that will necessarily benefit everyone. To some extent, that is true, especially if we define value in regards to our common humanity, in regards to sustainability, in regards to morality. But it's not necessarily true all the time if we recognize that people do value relative positioning. It's not going to be true in all contexts. It might be a context. I mean, it becomes an empirical question, right? What do we know? We know that for the dominant capital class, racism and social stratification is beneficial. We know that for Black people or those who are at the subaltern scale or those who are on the lower end, um, those who are an out identity that um, it's worse for them that they end up at the they end up being the bottom by which an intermediary class can be defined. What we don't know is whether the white working class is ultimately better or worse off. They become absolutely better off if we define material well-being beyond just the tribal notions of accumulation with no bounds and define it in terms of morality. But the question as to whether the white working class is ultimately better off in our current paradigm is, does, will, the, will the additional resources that accrue to them from class solidarity across race, will that outreach the material benefits as well as the psychological benefits associated with not being the last fired in an economic downturn or not being the first hired in an economic upswing. These are important benefits, unfortunately, um, that are able, and why do I say unfortunate? Because they're immoral, because they are using one's identity as having consequential value in the marketplace. Um, so that, that, that's my answer to that question. Um, the second question, uh, which is, this is really hard when you talk to yourself and you don't have a uh, feedback, uh, but let me go to the second question. Is there change on the horizon with the Biden administration? That, that's how I'm interpreting that question. Can we, uh, can we uh, impact, rel can we have improvements in racial disparities, racial economic and health disparities based on the Biden administration? Um, the jury's out. We've had the first 100 days. Um, there have been social movements that have pushed us to the point where 
certain policies that might have been unconceivable in the Democratic platform, say, 10 years ago, are actually feasible. Um, if you look at the rhetoric that's coming out of the, Bi the Biden-Harris administration, they are expressing clear values around racial equity. Now, of course, we're going to need to have accountability to go along with those values. Um, but I've noticed a shift in, in how we define and talk about disparity and relative well-being. Um, we're, we're hearing from the Biden administration. I mean, just recently, shout out to Jared Bernstein for pushing back on a narrative that came out of Larry Summers. Again, going back to austerity politics, talking about what we can and cannot afford in a deficit frame when we're talking about the, li the li livability in a pandemic for, as I point out, our most treasured resource, which is its people. If we're not defining economic well-being in terms of human capabilities and our people, then you know we're not we're, we have government that's misplaced, that's not thinking about the right thing. So not only that, there's great conversations around race equity that's starting to percolate in the Biden administration, but there's a long way to go. And we just had an election, and we you know we, we're just seeing the initiatives. I think ultimately whether the Biden administration will do it or not. It's up to us. We have to make them do it. You know, I go and revert back to the classical line that came out of the FDR during the New Deal politics when he said, make me do it. So again, we need to seize that power. We need to recognize that, again, I'm going to use those three phrases. It's our government, it's our economy, and it's our monetary system. So change will have come when we seize it, when we make it happen. So whether it's Biden, whether it's Obama, whether it's Hillary Clinton, um, dare I say, whether it's Trump, we seize the power. It is up to us to facilitate change in a moral economy where one's race, one's gender has no material or psychological or secure or secure economic security, meaning as it relates to marketplace transactions. OK, well, thank you so much for that, Derek. Uh, I'm sorry that you can't hear me. Um, but I just sent you a message. Um, but um, thanks, everyone, for coming along. Uh, that was a really great introduction. Sorry, to... I can't hear the wrap up and I'm probably talking over the speaker. So I'm just going to say thank you to everyone. <laughs> yeah, cool, cool. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much again for that, Derek. Uh, and sorry about those slight technical issues. I'm not sure what really was going on there. Um, but I think everyone else can hear me, judging by the thumbs up. So um, what we have now is we have three different sessions that are taking place uh, on three different stages.